Today, in our consideration of the seven deadly sins, we are going to consider one which perhaps is more difficult than the others and perhaps requires us to be even more prayerful in our consideration of this particular difficulty, which is lust. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church gives us a good starting point because it has a a very succinct definition of what lust is. This is what it says. Lust is disordered desire for or inordinate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure is morally disordered when sought for itself, isolated from its procreative and unitive purposes. Well, that is very dense. And so we'll unpack it a little bit. First of all, the the, the key words there are disordered and inordinate. They're always the key words in talking about a virtue like this, or a vice rather, because there is the virtue, which is the ordered enjoyment of something, in this case, sexual pleasure. And when it is ordered or ordinate, it's not immoral. In fact, it can be holy, even sacred. That is when the enjoyment is ordered towards its purpose, it's going in the right direction. And the right direction for sexual enjoyment is towards the two things that we saw there. It's procreative and it's unitive purposes. So all ordered sexual activity has a dual purpose. One is procreative and the other is unitive. Procreative is kind of obvious. Uh, the procreative act by its very nature is, is, is something whereby a man and a woman cooperate in God's creation of a new human being. So obviously there's something extremely, extremely special about that. So procreation. Unitive though, what is that? That is the body language. What we should be, all ordered, ordinate sex should be unitive. In other words, expressing and in, and deepening the love between a man and a woman. In other words, uniting them more and more. So those two purposes should always be there. All sexual activity should include these two essential elements, the procreative, at least implicitly, in other words, not positively altering the sexual act so the pre- pro- pre- procreation excuse me will become impossible so in other words artificial contraception and then unitive also wrong would be to engage in a loveless intercourse just to have children and they're just completely loveless no no uniting no deepening in love being sought only to have children well that was uh, free enough that is also wrong however we all know that sexual pleasure exerts a very strong pull on, on everybody. And so much so that even the word lust, it just comes from the old English word lust, which means simply pleasure or delight. So it's kind of funny, but the name for this deadly sin just comes from an old, very old word for pleasure, delight, because the sexual pleasures are particularly, you could say, pleasant and particularly delightful, strongly. And since they're so powerful, we have to really work hard at this virtue to, to ensure that sexual desire doesn't go off the rails, that it's always ordered, ordinate. Because if it, if it doesn't, if we, if we don't keep it on track, on those train tracks, well then being a capital sin, precisely, it leads to a lot more sins. A lot is coming down the line from lust. The Catechism of the Catholic Church lists off a couple of them. It says, talks about masturbation, fornication, pornography, prostitution, rape. So even as something as as dramatically wrong, even criminal as say rape, comes from this, a person who's dominated by lust. So, So we have to be very careful not to let this get its claws into us. As St. Augustine, who had personal experience of this, of course, he said, lust yielded to becomes a habit, and a habit not resisted becomes a necessity. So he knew you have to fight. All of us have to be really determined to fight this vice because we do not want to essentially destroy love because that's what lust does. The two are incompatible, lust and love. St. John Paul II explained this very well in his famous Theology of the Body. When he talked about true attraction, love, 
means that we desire the other person's good, especially in a marriage, through the very gift of myself. But lust desires my own transitory pleasure through the use and even abuse of the other person. So really it's the exact opposite. We shouldn't fool ourselves. Lust and love may be very superficially, they might look like they're, some, they're the same thing, but they're, they couldn't be farther apart. The woman at whom a man gazes lustfully becomes an object, not a person. St. John Paul II says, sex is reduced just to a means for satisfying a, a kind of greedy need. So what are we to do? We have to fight back. Real, real determination to fight in this. And it's one of the things we're doing over Lent, in fact, because as St. Thomas Aquinas, he points out that one of the purposes of fasting is in order to, the way he puts it, bridle the lust of the flesh. Previous Saint Saint Jerome is, he's at the same time as Saint Patrick. He has an interesting line. He says Venus, that's the goddess of love, grows cold when Ceres, the god of food, and Bacchus, the god of drink, are not there. So if you want to quiet down Venus, make sure that Ceres and Bacchus are absent. Make sure that we're fasting with food and drink. It's a, it's it's not the whole battle, but it does help an awful lot. Saint Augustine says something similar. Fasting cleanses the soul, raises the mind, subjects one's flesh to the spirit, quenches the fire of love, kindles the true light of chastity. So there's a lot to be gained from our fasting. So I think that's an encouragement for us over these weeks of Lent also, that one of the reasons that we're fasting is to help us to battle and to acquire this really important virtue of chastity. I give you thanks, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you for help to put them into effect. My Mother Immaculate, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.